This is a video I certainly did not want to make, but I have thoughts I need to get off my chest. Ruby is currently my favourite web series. In spite of their flaws, I really did enjoy volumes 1, 2, and 3. As far back as volume 1 of Ruby, I saw something really quite exciting. A work of art with masses of potential made by a small, but passionate, independent company. Ruby Volume 1 was a diamond in the rough, and upon seeing it, I was excited to see how and if the creators would cut it into a beautiful gem as the series went on. After Volume 2 came out, I could see that the creators of Ruby were actually listening to criticism, trying to avoid and fix mistakes they had made. They made some new mistakes, but I could see they were trying to improve what they had, and this impressed me. Then Volume 3 came out, and I have very few complaints or criticisms. Ruby Volume 3 is definitely the highlight of the series. Then Volume 4 came out, and I was rather disappointed, but I didn't make any criticisms, out of respect for Monty Erm's passing. I thought that the writers and creators were in grief after the main creator and director Monty Erm had died, and I thought that this had affected the quality of their work, so I decided to discount Volume 4's problems, and eagerly awaited Volume 5. I was convinced by that time the writers would come out of their grief, and create something fantastic. I do hate having my hopes dashed. Ruby Volume 5 is better than Volume 4, but that is the most positive verdict I can give, and it still has the worst aspects of Volume 4, that being the absence of plot progression, and chapters where the characters don't do anything meaningful. Now to discuss what has gone wrong with this volume, I had to discern the main appeals of Ruby as a show, so I had a discussion with a Crow-esque companion of mine, and we managed to uncover what we think are the three main pillars of appeal in the series. First, the action. Monty Erm was a master at choreography, and watching the colour trailers for Ruby for the first time was quite the experience. The first thing I noticed about the series was the way it did action, over the top and intensely satisfying. The first three volumes of Ruby contain action scenes you can watch multiple times and detect something new each time. The action makes the show stand out, along with other animated series crafted with fantastic action. In fact, the action is what gives Ruby its identity. The style of the action is a key idiosyncratic trait, and if you were to take away the style of the fights, the show would be much duller as a result. Secondly, the world. The world of Ruby is an interesting fusion of sci-fi and fantasy, mixed with references to the Brothers Grimm fairy tales. Dust is an interesting material, Aura and semblances being extensions of the soul is an interesting concept. Grimm make for imaginative monsters, and the state of the moon raises all kinds of questions. The world in a larger sense, including its cities, nations, forests, and geographic regions, are also intriguing. And in the hands of a skilled writer, it is the perfect place to start building the story. Many fans wanted to see the world of Remnant expanded upon and developed, which is why I, and many others, gobbled up the world of Remnant videos with relish. Thirdly, the characters. The writers of Ruby said they deliberately made the characters two-dimensional in the first episodes, so they could reveal deeper aspects and nuances of the characters in future episodes. It worked. When I first started watching Volume 1, I thought the writers had created flat characters from a lack of skill. It was only after I had finished Volume 1 that I realised the writers knew what they were doing. Shortly after, I really fell for the characters, and was eager to see further development and growth. People really did like the characters. If you need proof of this, one only needs to go to DeviantArt and type Ruby in, or ask fans about their reactions to Pyrrha's death, or you could check the amount of shipping the fandom partakes in. I honestly hadn't seen such an active shipping community before I discovered Ruby. So those, in the opinion of my companion and I, are the three main pillars which make the series what it is, and which attracted such a large fandom. Now, there are no doubt other reasons people were attracted to this show. Someone I know started watching the show because he enjoyed the songs and the music. Now, I have to say that Volume 5 does not treat these pillars with the respect they are owed, and I think this is the reason why Volume 5 feels soulless and empty. Number 1. The Action There are some good action scenes in Ruby Volume 5. The Yang vs. Bandit's fight in Chapter 4 was not a badly put together battle. The altercation between Weiss and the Flying Grim in Chapter 2 was entertaining, and the fight between Raven and Cinder in Chapter 13 was good. If the action in this volume had been up to the standard of the Raven vs Cinder fight, there wouldn't be much to criticise. Now at this point I must admit to knowing relatively little about animation. Here is the only real animation of any quality that I have ever made.
so I don't feel I am qualified to talk about the technical animation aspects of the fights in much detail. However, I can recommend a YouTuber called Cake, who has done a very short and concise five video series on the subject, criticising Volume 4's handling of action sequences. After watching his videos, I can detect some of the issues he raises in not only Volume 4, but Volume 5. I shall put links to his videos in the description for anyone interested. However, I don't need to know the technical aspects of animation to point out what I think is the biggest problem in Volume 5 with regards to action. The fighting simply lacks energy. This scene, I believe, epitomises my point. Quiet now. I don't believe I even have to explain what is wrong here, but I shall. Someone is getting throttled to death in this scene, and he barely struggles against his opponent. His legs aren't moving, he isn't even trying to push his opponent off him, and the winged faunus doesn't even seem to be putting any effort into strangling him. They look like a pair of bad amateur stage actors, with a massive amount of stage fright hanging over their heads and the possibility of fiery judgement from the health and safety authorities of the local parish council. It does nothing to convince the audience that one faunus is dying and the other is killing him. Neither is acting like they are doing anything urgent or worthy of their full attention. Now, I think this is the most obvious example of the lack of energy which I noticed in the action scenes in this volume. However, the other examples are more subtle, but nevertheless noticeable upon re-watching. Here is Yang fighting Mercury in Volume 5. Now, here is Yang fighting Mercury in Volume 3. Fight! Do you notice any differences? The fight from Volume 3 has qualities of dynamicism and energy, the blows are fast and the counters are slick, and the flow between offensive and defensive stances are smooth and quick. To hammer this point home, here are some scenes of Crow fighting in Volume 5. Running away was one thing, but this, you've crossed the line. Sorry, brother. Sometimes family disappoints you like that. We're not family anymore. Were we ever? I thought so. But I guess I was wrong. <laughs> Tell him, Austin. Tell him how you killed him. Now you can forgive me for what I'm about to do. Now here is some of the Crow vs. Winter fight in Volume 3. <laughs> Again, in Volume 3, the fights are filled with energy, and most importantly, purpose. Both fights I've shown from Volume 3 depict characters who actually want to defeat each other. Yang and Mercury, in their Vital Festival match, are trying their best to defeat each other. Each fighter is using all their skills to try and best the other. The Crow vs Winter fight starts out slightly differently from the Yang vs Mercury one. While Winter seems dead serious about cutting Crow's tongue out, Crow treats it like a game at first. However, shortly into the fight, Crow starts treating Winter like a serious opponent, and even prepares to take out his scythe to deal with her. In Volume 5, the majority of the fights lack this sense of energy and purpose. No one seems to want to actually kill or defeat each other, and thus the fighting lacks any kind of dynamicism, energy, or conviction present in previous fights. Heck, the Crow vs Tyrion fight in Volume 4, a volume criticised for the quality of its action scenes, has far more energy and purpose than most of the fights in Volume 5. Now, I can hear a very serious objection. But your Imperial Majesty, the clips you have shown us from Volume 5 are but small sections from very short action shots. It is unfair to compare those fights from Volume 3 
to these ones in volume 5. This is a perfectly reasonable counterpoint, and it leads me right into my second gripe about the action scenes. In the previous volumes of Rupee, the impression I had was that the creators wanted us to see spectacular fights and action sequences. In this current volume, I have the impression that the creators of the show do not want us to see the fights. I don't know about you, but I wanted to see these three intense fight sequences in Ruby Volume 5. Crow vs Raven, Ruby vs Someone Evil, and Yang vs Mercury. I wanted to see Crow fight Raven because both characters are hyped up as being incredible fighters, and it would be a joy to watch. I wanted to see Ruby have a long fight scene with Someone Evil just to see how much she has improved as a fighter. And I wanted to see Yang and Mercury have a rematch because it would be fun to see how Yang took her father's advice about taking a calm, more calculated approach to combat. Initially, it seemed I got my wish in Chapter 11, as Crow does start fighting Raven. But this is the only footage of that engagement. Running away was one thing, but this, you've crossed the line. Sorry, brother. Sometimes family disappoints you like that. We're not family anymore. Were we ever? I thought so. But I guess I was wrong. <laughs> yes, that is all. Emerald also starts a fight with Ruby, and again it seemed like the audience was going to be treated to some great action. This is the entirety of the footage of Ruby and Emerald's combat. <laughs> Cinder everything. You want to fight her that bad? Be my guest. <gasps> yes, that is literally it. A rematch also starts between Yang and Mercury. This is all we get. I think there might just be a pattern. Why aren't these fights longer? Why does nobody seem to have any energy or desire to defeat each other? Everybody gets distracted when something new happens, and quit whatever they are doing to take in new information. Despite the fact that this is a sure way to get yourself killed by your opponent. In chapter 11, we see Crow fighting Raven. Now let's skip to chapter 12 where Hazel begins injecting himself with dust. You thought you could hide from me! <sighs> Why is Crow just standing there watching with a confused look on his face? I thought he was fighting Raven. Did he stop just so he could watch Hazel start tearing off his jacket? A few shots later we see this. Raven walking up to Cinder as if she has just come from the lavatory. Wasn't she fighting Crow? Did they both agree to a truce so they could watch Hazel start taking off his clothes? Why? What is happening in these chapters? A worst example of this can actually be seen in the previous chapter, when Weiss is stabbed through the chest by Cinder. Everyone looks at Weiss, including Mercury. Even the villains stop fighting their opponents to observe Weiss receive a fatal wound. Why is nobody focused on actually killing their opponent? And speaking about killing opponents, in this same chapter, Weiss has not only been stabbed, but Ruby has been knocked out by Emerald. Now, I can understand the reason why Emerald herself would not try killing Ruby in her vulnerable state. The reason? Because Cinder has made a point about hating Ruby, and Emerald, who likes Cinder very much, was probably leaving Ruby so Cinder could kill her. However, this raises the obvious question. Why didn't Cinder kill Ruby while she was unconscious? Everyone appears distracted by Weiss's injury, so there would be no one to stop her killing Ruby. Why doesn't she do it? She doesn't do anything else in this chapter, or the next chapter even, apart from going to the entrance of the vault. Did she just sit there twiddling her thumbs watching everyone fighting each other? Why didn't she use that precious time to attempt killing Ruby? She hates her. Why isn't she doing anything about it? However, Cinder is not the only one guilty of this. In this shot, we can see that several of the characters are on the ground, incapacitated, and there are currently four people actively fighting. Hazel and Lionheart are trying to kill Crow and Oscar slash Ozpin, so they are doing something. However, Emerald and Mercury are nowhere to be seen. Instead, they pick a fight with Yang. But there is an obvious question here. Why aren't they trying to kill any of the wounded people? They would be easy targets. And you can't tell me that Jean, Nora, and Ren Sitting down on the ground would put up much of a fight against both Emerald and Mercury. They'd make mincemeat of them. Again, why do the villains seem averse to killing their enemies when they have the opportunity? Emerald could have easily distracted Yang, 
with her illusions, leaving Mercury to try to kill either the unconscious Ruby or the incapacitated Weiss. Nora, Ren, and Jean are all sitting on the ground. They probably wouldn't be able to react in time, and Mercury doesn't even need to get close. All he has to do is fire a bullet and it would kill them. At this point, I can hear an excuse starting to develop to defend the problems in the action scenes I've detailed in both chapters 11 and 12. The reason for this low quality is that the Rooster Teeth animators didn't know how to animate a chaotic battle with multiple fighters. The problem with this defense is A, if they couldn't do it properly, they shouldn't have tried, and B, they actually can. Let's look at this single shot from Ruby Volume 3, Chapter 11. This, ladies and gentlemen, is what the fight in Haven Academy needed, because a shot like this establishes three things. First, the location, and everyone's place in it. Second, the combatants. And three, the scale of the conflict. It would have been easy to include a quick shot from a bird's eye view above the hall so we could see what everyone is doing. Lionheart is actually standing on the stairs above the hall, and doesn't start fighting until Oscar goes up to face him. We could have seen the battle from his perspective for a couple of seconds, because we don't have a shot like this one from Volume 3. We don't have a sense of the scale of the battle, and whenever the camera decides to focus on one particular fight, it seems random. There isn't an excuse for the low quality of the action in this volume, because not only have they made good fights in the past, but there are a few good ones in Volume 5 as well. It seems that they either didn't have the time to make these scenes work, or they just weren't putting any effort into it. Now, I have one final contention with the action scenes. Watch this scene from Volume 5, Chapter 9. Ah. Hurry! Dad! Where's Mom? I'm not sure. I got ambushed right away. Once we take down Corsic and Finnick... No, go now. But... You keep assuring me your friend isn't a complete waste of space. Let's see him prove it. We got this, Blake. I've wanted to sock these creeps since the day we met. You'll have to get in line. Blake, go! In this scene, Finnick and Corsic have their daggers stuck in the ice form that Blake tricked them with. Yet neither she, nor her father, nor son take this opportunity to either kill or knock out Finnick and Corsic. I'm 100% certain that the Blake of Volume 3 and before would have turned around and smacked them both in the face, rather than jump into the air and land next to her father and potential boyfriend. So what is so important that they have to stop fighting? Dialogue. Dialogue which doesn't add anything to the scene and goes on for too long. I understand that as a result of this verbal exchange, Blake is supposed to go off and fight Ilya, alone. But this whole scene lacks any urgency or energy. They talk for too long. If I were writing this scene, the dialogue would have been condensed into something like this. This would be a quick exchange of information, and would provide the scene with a sense of urgency and speed, rather than a slow, meditative, whenever you're ready tone that prevails in the original scene. Too often in Volume 5, action scenes are interrupted with dialogue exchanges and small monologues. Three of the worst examples are the Oscar vs Lionheart fight, the Cinder vs Jean fight, although to be fair, Cinder is playing with him, so it makes some sense, and the Oscar and Crow vs Hazel fight. The talking goes on and on, and the fighting just stops. No thought seems to have been given to whether the dialogue disrupts the flow of action or not. The creators have inserted dialogue whenever and wherever they want, and this chops the action up and reduces the tension. Number two, the world. There are some good things about Ruby Volume 5 in this regard. The lore of Ruby is further established, and questions are answered and explanations provided. Salem is established as an inherent force of evil, and we learn that Ozpin was created by the two gods of the universe to stop her. Oh, and yes, the two gods mentioned in Volume 4 are confirmed to be real as Ozpin says they cursed him for his failure to stop Salem. The question as to why Crow can turn into a bird, despite the fact he already has an uncontrollable semblance, is answered. The foreshadowing in Volume 1 about a man with two souls fighting for control finally has its payoff, in the form of Oscar and Ozpin, where Ozpin and Oscar frequently switch control to do different tasks. 
and the floating islands around the coastline of Mistral are nice to the eye. Those are the positive aspects of the world building. Now let's discuss the more negative things. Mistral City and Menagerie are two exotic locations which we haven't seen in much detail. We have been shown some of Menagerie, but by no accounts all of it or much of it. Mistral we barely see any of. Blake and Son stay in Gaia's house for the most part, and don't do an awful lot outside of it. Ruby and Gang are even worse. Crow goes to visit a few seedy and rainy locations to try and find some huntsmen, but that is all. Otherwise, everyone stays in their rented house. Why weren't we treated to all the beautiful sights of Mistral, since our heroes and heroines were there? We got to see vast amounts of Vale, including the docks, the shops district, and the cross-continental transit system tower of Beacon Academy. We also get to see the Forest of Foreverfall, and other woody areas in the Vale Kingdom, and Mountain Glen of course. We see a lot of Vale, and this allowed the audience to become familiar with that kingdom. We barely see anything of Mistral, and this is a big error in my view. Everything feels so confined and small. There isn't a sense of grandeur or size like there was in previous volumes. It's almost claustrophobic, and I don't think there has been a time where Remnant felt so small. I have one more thing to say about the world, and that is this. The just right petrol station. It doesn't belong. Not only does it look like it was photoshopped onto an image, rather than made part of it, but its design just doesn't look like it belongs in Mistral, or any of the other kingdoms in Remnant. It just doesn't fit the sci-fi fantasy setting that the show has built. Take away the city ramp and the humorous roof, and you could put this next to a motorway, and no one would think that it came from another world. To hammer this point home, here are some scenes from Volume 4, and Volume 5 showing us the architecture of Mistral. Now, does this station look like it was built by the people of Mistral? Also, what is it even dispensing? Petroleum? I thought everything ran off dust. Yes, I've heard it can be refined and altered in form, but I've never seen or heard anything about it being put into a liquid or turned into one. I always thought that Bumblebee, Yang's motorcycle, ran off dust crystals. I imagine there was a hatch somewhere which could be opened and dust poured in. Upon seeing this petrol station, I was instantly taken out of the world of Ruby and back into the modern world, which was a place where I didn't want to be at the moment of watching. Number three, the characters. Let's start with the good. Gaia and Callie are great characters, and basically loved by everyone, even some of the staunchest of Ruby critics like Blake's parents. Dr. Arthur Watts is the quintessential educated English villain, and I enjoyed all of his screen time as he is more threatening in some ways than Cinder, even if he lacks physical strength. Ilya's backstory is alright stuff, and explains a lot about her character and current motivations. She is also a useful character in showing that Adam doesn't have an excuse for the way he is acting. She has suffered terribly at the hands of the human master race, and yet she manages to let go of her hatred and do the right thing. Weiss can now use her summoning abilities, and it is awesome to watch that armor golem fight. Now into negative mode. Let's start with Ilya. I really liked a lot about this character. In particular, I liked her philosophy. Adam does evil things because he is evil, and seems to get a sinister satisfaction out of killing people, regardless of whether they are innocent or not. Ilya doesn't get such gratification from killing people, but she does it because she believes it's for the greater good. She has two main justifications for her actions. One, everyone is guilty of something and there are no innocents in a war. And two, sometimes evil acts have to be done for the greater good. In other words, evil acts can have good consequences. Although she is intent on killing Blake's parents, she doesn't want to do it. She just sees it as a cruel necessity. Blake, on the other hand, believes that doing something evil, even if it gets good results, is wrong and just shouldn't be done. Here we see two different views of morality, and it gives us some nice philosophical food to chew on. However, this is undermined by this part of the scene. You don't have to do this! This isn't you! Yes, it is. But I guess back then you were just too busy falling for Adam to notice. I was always jealous of the way you looked at him. 
I wanted you to look at me that way. But we can't always get what we want. Here, there is a strong implication that Ilya wouldn't be doing this if Blake had reciprocated her feelings of affection. We go straight from philosophizing about the moral implications of what Ilya is doing to a confession of unrequited attraction. I really do not like the implication that Ilya is essentially doing this because Blake never paid her any romantic attention. I don't like it, even being a possible motive or reason for her actions within the White Fang. I think it is silly and detracts from the rather serious themes of morality that were being explored previously in the conversation. The next character is Yang. So I have a small complaint and a large one. The small one is her trembling hand, which we see in chapters 1 and 4 which I thought was foreshadowing a nervous breakdown, but it turned out to just be a red herring. However, the main complaint I have is Yang doesn't have a character arc in this volume, and really she should, for two reasons. One, she has just recovered from emotional and physical trauma caused by having her hand cut off, and two, because she meets her mother for the first time. And yes, that end credit scene in volume two has been forgotten and completely retconned in case you were wondering. Since Volume 2, a great deal has been made about Yang wanting to meet her mother, and to ask why she left her. The fans have been waiting years to discover the answer to this question, and to see Yang's reaction to her mother's reason. Yang asks her mother this question once in Chapter 6, and that is the only time she ever asks Raven, despite the fact that Raven doesn't even answer the question. So for two volumes, Yang's desire to meet Raven and discover why she and her father were abandoned has been built up and the fans have awaited in anticipation, only to be let down and never told the secret. This is bad from two perspectives. The first is the fandom perspective. If you keep teasing at some great secret or mystery in a show, then the fans will be disappointed if you do not provide answers and learn to distrust the writer's intentions. The second is the character growth perspective. Yang's desire to know why Raven left her has been a cornerstone of her character. She was desperate to know just a volume or two ago, and now suddenly she doesn't care. Why not? What has changed? This was an opportunity for Yang to grow as a character, or develop as a person. This volume could have been one where we see her let go of her mother's absence, and learn to move on, perhaps even learn to forgive her mother, or the volume, where we see her become full of bitterness, anger, and rage. The possible ways she could have dealt with Raven's answer are numerous. Raven's answer isn't even that important. What is important is how Yang responds and changes when she hears it. This was a massive missed opportunity. Moreover, this means that Yang doesn't change as a person. She starts the volume hating her mother, and ends the volume also hating her mother. No progression, no growth, no change. Just complacency. Now, let's talk about the protagonist of the show, Ruby Rose. There's nothing to say about her. Nothing. She has learned how to fight with her fists, and her head, and that is it. She has not otherwise grown, developed, or changed as a character. She remains the innocent, mostly naive, sweet-natured girl she has always been. This has been a long-running issue I've had with the series. Almost every character is either developed or grown in each volume, but Ruby is neglected. She doesn't receive any attention from the writers, and I think this is because they don't know what to do with her. For instance, Ruby Rose is one of the few characters in Ruby who has not defeated a principal villain or an opponent in a fight by herself. Weiss has beaten Armoured Golem. Blake has beaten Torchwick, and now Adam, but let's not talk about that disappointment. And Yang has beaten Mercury and Junior. Ruby has beaten a Grim Gorilla, and that is all. She has also lost fights against Mercury, Tortric, and Neo, although she did make Neo go all Mary Poppins in her defence. Ruby is arguably underdeveloped as a fighter, and I think a lot of people have been wanting to see her best an opponent in a fight with her scythe. We never see this happen, and it is getting irritating. When is Ruby going to come into her own as a fighter? She is excellent at killing Grimm, but when will she be a threat to human opponents? Another issue is her silver eyes. A trait of hers which has had a foreshadowing moment in Volume 1, Chapter 1, which got its payoff in the last chapter of Volume 3, only to be forgotten in Volume 4, then remembered in Volume 5 for nothing to be done with it. Here's a question. Why didn't Ozpin try and help Ruby learn how to control the power of her silver eyes, rather than teach her how to use her fists? Her silver eyes seem far more dangerous than any scythe, or her puny little fists. It's been two volumes now. Aren't the audience entitled to know a little bit more about Silver Eyes? Even just the lore aspects of them? Now let's discuss Lionheart. 
I don't actually have a criticism of Lionheart's personality, but I do when it comes to his character design. When someone says a person has a lion's heart, or is a lion heart, we tend to think of mighty and impressive warriors. When I heard Lionheart's name mentioned in Volume 4, I imagined someone like Richard the Lionheart. And the common image of Richard the Lionheart is a tall, bearded, muscular man, someone to fear in battle. They have certainly got Lionheart's hair right, but he is just about the same height as Crow. He doesn't look strong or physically impressive in any way. Other than his aforementioned hair, he doesn't look lion-like at all. Seriously, does he look like he was a mighty fearsome warrior in the past, who led daring missions and charges against the Grimm? Does he even look like he is, or ever was, capable of killing Grimm? Also, look at his weapon. It's a shield which shoots magical rocks at people. A ranged weapon isn't fitting for a warrior who has, or did have, a lion's heart. A warrior with a lion heart should have something like a greatsword, or a sword and shield. Either one of these weapons would be infinitely more useful for leading attacks from the front, a leadership style you would expect from someone who was described as having a lion heart. If my point is still coming across as a little opaque, then let me ask this question once more. Does he look like he was once a mighty, fearsome warrior who led daring missions and charges against the Grimm? If I were told to design him, I would have drawn him much taller and with far broader shoulders and given him a big sword. He would still act cowardly and be useless at fighting, but there would be the suggestion that at one time he was a mighty huntsman. Personally, I think what happened is the character designers were told they had to create a cowardly character and were not told that he was supposed to be a really brave and courageous hero at one point in his life, and thus just designed a cowardly person. The directors then saw him and thought his current design would suffice and didn't bother asking for his design to be altered. Finally, I want to address one of the final scenes in chapter 14. Team Ruby is reunited, after being separated for one full volume and most of this current volume. Blake is still feeling guilty about leaving Yang in her time of suffering, and Yang still hasn't forgiven Blake for her abandonment. I don't know about you, but I was expecting Blake to act ashamed, and Yang to be standoffish at first. Then I predicted Blake would say something along the lines of, I'm so sorry for what I did, and Yang to soften up, hug her, and then both of them to break down weeping. Then perhaps Ruby and Wise to hug Yang and Blake and start crying as well. This is what happens instead. <sighs> I feel like I should be asking you guys. So, Blake, what are you doing here? I... I was gonna ask you three the same thing. That's a long story. Well, I'm not going anywhere. That's all that matters. That we're all here together. Right? You're lost, you found, your heart to pin down. Yeah. I never know if you'll come through. When you appear. Can anyone reasonably call that an apology? Or call what Yang said words of forgiveness? Also notice that none of Team Ruby are crying, and this volume has the most crying of all the other volumes put together. Crying is a frequent occurrence in Volume 5, but not here apparently. And if there was one scene, one scene, where the characters should have started crying, it would be the reunification scene right here. Heck, considering everything the characters have been through and everything they have done, they would have had difficulty keeping it together even if they were men. This scene was not nearly as emotional as it should have been, and the hurt feelings between Blake and Yang are just brushed under the carpet rather than properly dealt with. Disappointed does not even begin to describe my feelings about the construction of this scene. Number 4. Other Things It took Ranger a whole volume to get to the City of Mistral. Yang and Weiss only get there quickly because of Raven's semblance, and yet it takes Blake, Sun, and the Faunus army only a chapter or two to get to Mistral. How did they get there so fast? Menagerie has to be hundreds, perhaps even thousands of miles away from Mistral City. How did they get there so quickly? And just in time to stop Adam from blowing up Haven Academy. Transporting an army of hundreds is difficult work. You can't just put them on airships and start flying north. You have to consider logistics such as food and water, bedding and training drills. That is a lot to organise in the course of a week, let alone a few days, which is the suggested amount of time that passes between chapters 10 and 11. 
Also, the transportation of the Faunus army raises several other questions. First, why did the Council of Mistral allow this army to move through their borders? Presumably, Gaia asked for permission to enter Mistral, otherwise the authorities might have well assumed they were being invaded. However, in order for the Council to even consider letting the Faunus army into their country, they would want to know the reason they wanted to enter. Meaning, that Mistral Council would know that Adam and the White Fang were going to destroy Haven Academy, which raises an obvious question. Why weren't the Mistral authorities lying in wait to capture Adam and his men? Because it looks like Blake and the Mistral police arrived at the last minute to arrest them, rather than moved in to close a planned trap. Also, Lionheart is on the Mistral Council, so he would have been aware of any diplomatic communications with the Faunus of Menagerie, so he would know that an army was coming to try and stop Adam's destruction of Haven Academy. So why didn't he tell Cinder, Adam, or anyone else? Why did he keep it to himself? He did everything he could to help Salem with her plans before. Why would he allow something like an army of Faunus to interfere with the plans of the mistress he so fears? Ospin tells us that the gods gave him the order to stop Salem, but he failed, and they punished him with reincarnation. So for centuries, he has been trying to stop Salem, but he has not been successful yet. If the gods really want Salem gone, why haven't they given Ozpin more power so he can actually defeat her, or selected someone more capable? Unless Ozpin is lying, which is possible, or they actually enjoy the conflict between humanity and the Grimm commanded by Salem, this makes no sense. I thought they wanted Salem gone. Why are the gods absent? The writers have decided that Jean should no longer be comic relief, and Nora should fulfill that role. Oh, we'll break his legs! Not necessarily a bad decision. However, some of the lines they give Nora are terrible. I'm afraid this all must be very perplexing. And alarming, and bizarre, and just really kind of hard to believe overall. Raven? Crow? They're birds! Cracked it! Were any of these lines really funny? Because to me, they fall completely flat. This volume is also lacking anything of romance. The first three volumes, we had two romantic subplots, Jean and Pierre's and Weiss and Neptune's. We also get hints of romantic attraction between Blake and Son and Ren and Nora. In volume four, we actually have some character development for Ren and Nora, and their friendship is developed in an encouraging direction. In previous volumes, there was a clear sense of longing between characters, most notably with Pierre, because Jean was blind to her affections and she didn't have the courage to tell him. Then also with Weiss, who was quite clearly into Neptune. Her romantic desires were played for comedy, unlike Pyrrha's, but they were still there. We don't have anything of the sort in Volume 5. Ilya doesn't count because she has since given up on her feelings for Blake. So what about Sun and Blake? Well, nothing really happens. They go on a date, but they discuss Blake's ex-boyfriend. That is not what is supposed to happen on a date. In fact, it's a massive red flag. No one expresses feelings for the other. Sun does seem into Blake, that is apparent, but he seems comfortable waiting. He is in no rush to confess any feelings he might have, and he seems as cool as iced tea around her. So it's hard for the audience to discern that he really cares for Blake in a romantic way. While both Blake and Sun remain in the zone of discussing exes, I don't honestly think we will see any romantic progression. The only other possible ship in the volume is that of Ruby and Oscar, and here we have not a lot. It is hinted that Oscar has reached the stage of adolescence, and is now developing feelings for the opposite sex, and Ruby is more or less in his league. Oscar, like most on the cusp of adolescence, likely doesn't know he is developing romantic feelings, so not a lot can be done with it. Unlike Pyrrha in Volume 1, who was very clearly into Jean from day one, and knew that she wanted his attention and affection, Oscar is not mature enough to know what is going on, or critically examine his feelings and decide what he wants. So not a lot happens with regards to romance. Which is a shame, because nothing happens in the majority of the episodes, and some fleshing out of a romance, or romantic feelings, could have made some of the episodes more interesting to watch. I am reminded of the Carden and Jean arc in Volume 1. That arc would have been boring and uninteresting to watch, if there wasn't any of the relationship development between Jean and Pyrrha. As it happens, because of the relationship development, the episodes were not only interesting to watch, but also fundamental to the condition of Jean and Pira's relationship in Volume 2. But instead, hardly anything romantic is developed in Volume 5, and nothing of interest happens in the vast majority of the episodes. Which brings me to the story of the volume and its episodes. As stated before, nothing happens in the majority of the episodes. Our characters, for the most part, sit in their rooms and do nothing but talk and talk, 
and talk, and talk again. The story doesn't move. For too many of the episodes, nobody does anything which affects the plot. The whole volume moves forward, at a snail's pace. And even when the action gets started, it's disappointing, lacklustre, and confusing. I think the episode which is most clearly representative of this problem is Chapter 7, Rest and Resolutions. Now here, I must describe the two different types of fan service. The first is of the sexually titillating kind. And examples of this one can be found in most anime series, often taking place at the beach, where the characters wear swimming costumes. The second is characters getting up to random, humorous shenanigans. A good example of this would be Mass Effect 3's Citadel DLC, or to a more limited extent, the first chapter of Volume 3, where teams Ruby and Juniper enjoy a meal together. Chapter 7 falls into the latter category of fan service. I would have actually enjoyed the episode, but for two problems. One, they spend the entire episode talking about things that have already happened, rather than doing anything interesting or funny. The most interesting parts of the episode for me were Ruby getting excited over Yang's robotic arm, and the arm wrestle between Yang and Nora. That is it. Nothing else happens but boring conversation about prior events which were more interesting to watch than to hear about. 2. This entire episode was unearned. Nothing exciting or meaningful in terms of plot progression has happened. In Chapter 1 of Volume 3, when teams Ruby and Juniper enjoyed a meal of noodles together, Team Ruby had just come from a battle, and it was an opportunity for the writers to show us what the Festival Green looked like, so that when the Battle of Beacon took place, we could feel the characters' dismay when they saw all the stalls burning. It was also a very short scene, and did not dominate the entire episode or slow down the pace of the plot. This chapter, however, does. Another problem is the story itself. When things actually get moving at a sensible speed, the audience is not invested. The audience is never told what the relic does, so we cannot feel any fear about Cinder or Salem getting their hands on it. In Volume 3, we were shown what somebody could do with the Maiden powers before Cinder acquired them fully. So there was actual tension when we realised Beacon was being attacked, and that Cinder was going to try and kill the Autumn Maiden. Moreover, there was a character conflict tied to the Maiden, that being Pyrrha's conflict over whether she should choose to be the Autumn Maiden or not, and this gave the audience even more reason to be concerned with who obtained the Maiden's powers. But what of this relic? It's magical, that much is certain, but we have no idea what it does. It's nothing more than a MacGuffin, and until it becomes more than that, the audience cannot be expected to care about it. Number 5. Conclusion. I have discussed the three main pillars of the series, and how they are handled in Volume 5 along with some other problems, so now I have to tie this all together. The action, the world, and the characters in my view have not been treated with due reverence, and for fans like me, it is really saddening. What we liked about the show is being executed poorly. The action just doesn't feel the same. It's slow, it lacks energy, dynamicism, and purpose. The action just doesn't feel like it belongs in Ruby. Yes, there is the usage of Semblance's aura and dust, but it feels dull, and it just doesn't grip the audience. On the surface, the action is Ruby, but at its core, it's something else. The writers don't know what to do with this large and beautiful world they crafted in Volumes 1-4. to They seem content on hiding it from us, and confining us into small spaces, rather than showing us all the wonders their animation and design teams can conjure. They also don't know how to properly expand their characters. Motivations that have existed since the early episodes have been forgotten and neglected. Growth for the significant characters is ignored consistently, and I'm not entirely convinced that they know where they are going with them. Now, I've bought all the volumes of Ruby on Blu-ray, and have watched them multiple times, as well as the creator's commentaries. I did this because I wanted to support Rooster Teeth, and their ability to create more of these volumes. I enjoyed the action, the world building, and the characters in the first three volumes, and I wanted to see these things expanded further and tied together in a well-crafted plot and story. But now I find myself unable to justify spending money to import a Blu-ray disc from the USA. I just didn't enjoy Ruby Volume 5 for reasons which I hope have been elucidated, and I don't know whether the creators are listening to criticism or even intend to learn from their mistakes, because plenty of my criticisms can also be applied to Volume 4. Because of this, it might be time for me to let go of the show. It is most heart-wrenching, but it was a fun ride while it lasted. I hope you enjoyed this video, and that you have an excellent day. Now that was a very sombre note to end my video on. However, there are two things in Ruby Volume 5 I think everybody can like, and I think everyone will agree that these are good. 
the memes and the fan art.